everybody. My name is Shelby Brown, and I'm talking for everybody here at the Villa to say that it's really exciting to do a wine program again in the Outer Peristyle. Thank you for agreeing. <laughs> As many of you know who have been to these programs before, this is our series that explores art, wine, and culture in the ancient world. And the program today complements our exhibition, Persia, Ancient Iran, and the Classical World, which was co-curated by Sarah Cole and Jeffrey Spear. But without further ado, I would like to ask Sarah Cole to come up and talk to us about the exhibition. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sarah Cole, and I'm delighted to introduce you to this evening's Bacchus Uncorked program. I'm an assistant curator of antiquities here at the Villa, and I'm one of the co-curators of our current special exhibition, Persia, Ancient Iran, and the Classical World, to which our program tonight is related. I hope you've all had the chance to visit this exhibition, but in case you haven't, it's going to be on view on the second floor of the villa until August 8th, so we hope you will come back and see it. This is the second in a series of antiquities exhibitions um, that we are calling The Classical World in Context. Here at the Villa, our permanent collection is made up primarily of antiquities from Greece, Rome, and Etruria. But of course, the ancient Mediterranean and Near East was populated by many other great cultures and civilizations who exchanged influences with Greece and Rome. And those cross-cultural relationships are what this series aims to explore. By organizing major international loan exhibitions, we can expand the narrative we tell here at the Villa about the ancient world and demonstrate how diverse and interconnected the ancient Mediterranean was. So we began in 2018 with an exhibition about ancient Egypt and its relationship with Greece and Rome, and the Persia exhibition is now the second in our series. The exhibition covers a period of about 1,200 years, beginning with the establishment of the Persian Empire in the Achaemenid period around 550 BC, and that is the focus of the first section of the exhibition. Then we have a gallery dedicated to the second phase of the empire under the Parthian rulers, who rose to power in the third century BC in the wake of Alexander the Great's conquests. And then our third and final gallery of the exhibition explores the Sasanian dynasty, which is the dynasty that ruled up until the Arab conquest of AD 651. This is the first exhibition to explore the relationship between Persia, Greece, and Rome over the full chronological span of the ancient Persian Empire, and it brings together significant works of art from over 30 lending institutions. Our speaker this evening is Professor Toraj Dariai, who holds the Masi Endowed Chair in Persian Studies and Culture and is the director of the Dr. Samuel M. Jordan Center for Persian Studies and Culture at the University of California, Irvine. His research focuses on the ancient through early medieval history of Iran, and specifically the Sasanian Empire. He's also an expert on Iranian languages, numismatics, and Zoroastrianism, not to mention ancient board games, food, gardens, and of course, wine. Toraj has produced many monographs, as well as numerous chapters and articles in both English and Persian, and he regularly serves as editor of various books and journals. A highlight relevant to our topic today is his role as a co-editor and contributor to Food for Gods, Food for Mortals, Culinary and Dining Practices in the Greater Iranian World, which is the first volume in a new series on the history, cultures, and religions of the Iranian world produced through the UCI Center for Persian Studies. He also contributed to the beautiful catalog for our exhibition, which is available for purchase in our bookstore. And his talk for us today is entitled, Drinking Like a Persian King. And now, please welcome tonight's speaker, Professor Toraj Dariai. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, it is really a great pleasure to be here back at the Getty Villa. And uh, it's a wonderful place. I never get tired of it. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, uh, Sarah Cole for that kind introduction, as well as Jeffrey Spear, who 
uh, 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 been very kind and included me in this wonderful volume on ancient uh, Persia that uh, uh, came out, and it's just right across. Uh, for purchase, I'd like to thank uh, Ali Rezojan Ardakani and the Farang Foundation for partnering with uh, the Getty uh, to really bring the community in uh, to the museum. Um, and also, of course, Lisa Guzetta and Shelby Brown, who've been doing all the logistics and making sure uh, my uh, PowerPoint is up to standard. <laughs> now I know how it should be done. So uh, in the 30 minutes that I do have, I'd like to uh, briefly survey uh, wine as there is evidence for it on the Iranian plateau. But furthermore, perhaps, let's begin with the earlier part. Uh, I think one of the foremost uh, scholars in the study of wine is Patrick McGovern, uh, who has produced a number of textbooks. Uh, these are rising from uh, conferences. For example, the first one, uh, which is the origins and ancient history of wine, uh, which uh, was uh, put together at the Mondavi Vineyard. So I hope we have another conference at another vineyard to talk about this, or perhaps the Getty is a great place to be. And uh, he's from the University of Pennsylvania. So he came up with that text about more than a decade ago, which traced the earliest evidence as it existed about 10, 15 years ago. And then uh, the next book was produced, which is a bit more recent and has changed their idea of the earliest production of wine uh, in the world. Now, uh, the most important, actually, invention that uh, really brings about fermentation and wine is the pot. This is this, one of the most important inventions, I think, uh, of the Neolithic period, because if you have a pot, you could make pottage or make food, and of course you could ferment, right? Uh, things such as grapes and make wine or beer. And so it's the Neolithic revolution that, and this pot from, this is from Sialf, not necessarily that this was, uh, wine was being fermented in that, but something similar to it uh, that allows us for uh, drinking wine uh, uh, from this period onwards. Now, uh, McGovern uh, had access to early 1960s archaeological reports of the University of Pennsylvania. And there it was uh, known uh, from the excavations that in this very same pot that you're seeing that Mr. McGovern is uh, looking at, there were sediments of grape and wine fermentation. And so 15 years ago and 10 years ago, you would say the earliest place that we know in history that uh, produced wine was at the locations of Godin Tape and Haji Firuz Tape in northwestern Iran. And so uh, this was uh, the new idea and brought it to about 5,000, give or take, 400 years of life. But then, in the Caucasus in Armenia, uh, we had another discovery. And I remember the late Professor Gregory Areshian, who unfortunately passed away just a couple of years ago because of COVID, had actually dug in one of these caves and found a very old shoe as well. So we always talked about the oldest shoe in the world, but also another pot that produced actually an even earlier date for wine, 6,000 BC. So, you know, this is fantastic, exactly at the cusp of this Neolithic revolution. And then uh, something else that happened. Uh, in Georgia, uh, there was evidence of even earlier wine production. So what you could see is, and if I can walk, if I am allowed, you could see this area, the Caucasus and northwestern Iran and Mesopotamia, is the place that you find the earliest evidence of winemaking. Okay? So these are archaeological evidence and uh, great Stone Age wine production may be in, uh, in progress. Uh, but if we really want to get really more details about what is going on uh, about wine in uh, this region, uh, we have to look at uh, ancient Persia under the Tisbet Achaemenid Persian Empire, which the first room that you enter today, here is a view of it. Uh, you'll see uh, where there is lots more evidence for this. And it is here that uh, during this 
200 years of 6th to 4th century BCE, where the largest empire of antiquity, really an Afro-Eurasian empire, came into being uh, to create, to bring to the resources of the different satrapies, provinces together. And obviously, uh, if you're a great king, uh, you always want to have the best of everything. So not only at the center at the court, but also at the centers of the uh, courts in these satrapies, we find evidence of wine drinking. Uh, but even I, I really like this uh, quote or passage from Athenius, uh, where they're in his uh, dinner, uh, philosophers, it's a text that's at the end of the second, I think, third century, really, CE, that uh, the Romans are imagining uh, what the ancient Persians were doing. And they're saying that Darius the Great, the third of the Achaemenid rulers, on his tomb, and his tomb would be very close, this is in Nakhshar Rostam, would have had this inscription, I could drink much wine and yet carry it well. So he can hold his wine. I mean, I think we get this, right? Uh, but, you know, why? Why does Athenaeus have such a conception of that these Persians like to drink as such? Well, for that, we could look at Herodotus, a wonderful anthropologist uh, in many ways, who makes these observations uh, from hearsay or from uh, really uh, having uh, heard uh, of what the Persians do when they drink. And I think this is at the, uh, at the villa as well in the exhibition. Uh, Herodotus says, oh, I can reach from here, I can't. Uh, they, that is the Persians, are very fond of wine. If an important decision is to be made, they discuss the question when they are drunk. Hmm, that's strange. And the following day, submit their decision for reconsideration when they are sober. If they still approve it, it is adopted. If not, it is abandoned. Very strange idea, <laughs> right? Uh, and I want you to see there's someone from the edge looking towards this great empire has heard something, and that's what comes through this sort of many uh, voices. And I'll give you an answer to that, why that is, what he was really trying to say. So again, uh, as the great king and as the great satraps, you go and you uh, require that the best water, what is the lightest water? So that apparently is found in Europe. Bring me the water. And then for wine at the time, at least uh, the sources tell us Mesopotamia, where we just saw, the region of Assyria, where there's a wonderful exhibition here, that region seems to have been a favorite place to bring wine and the fruits from the Caucasus. That's what the Persian king liked. And these are some of these um, uh, bearers of items of luxury and perhaps things within these uh, uh, objects. And then Xenophon has a very interesting passage uh, where uh, it tells us literally that the Persian king really liked wine and he liked good wine. The Persian king has vintners scouring every land to find some drink that will tickle his palate. So palate is very important as he would know and the sommeliers would know. Uh, it is in this empire of uh, the Achaemenids that we begin to find now because of these Persepolis fortification tablets that came uh, to um, University of Chicago uh, in the Elamite language that uh, we get more detailed knowledge of what is going on. We know now there were wine storages where actually there were head of wine cellars and wine suppl suppliers we're getting a very now interesting and detailed, uh, actually, description of how this process works. And we see that actually there are wine producers that are both men and women. So women have vineyards. That's something I think to think about for antiquity, as well as men, and as well as younger apprentices, both uh, boys and girls, who are working at these vineyards. And we now can reconstruct actually even the old Persian term for a wine press. So lots of interesting details, but of course I didn't want to completely put you to sleep uh, uh, with all the details as such. Uh, Xenophon, again, uh, gives us passages or glimpses in his different texts about Persian mannerism. Uh, an interesting one for me is about uh, Cyrus the Great and his grandfather, Astyagus, who is the last Median king before he is uh, dethroned by his 
uh, grandson, Cyrus. They're at this really nice court, uh, median court, and there is the wine bearer named Sakas. So wine is important, but the office of cup bearer seems to have been something very special. And it should have been a very trusted person. And so there's a debate, and Cyrus says to Astyagus, the king, uh, why is this Sakas such a favorite of yours? And Astyagus turns to him and says, Astyagus replied with a jest, do you not see, said he, how nicely and gracefully he pours the wine? Now the cupbearers of those kings perform their office with fine airs. They pour in the wine with neatness and then present the goblet, conveying it with three fingers. So that's how you're supposed to hold the wine, okay, if you're really good, right? And offer it in such a way as to place it most conveniently in the grasp of one who is to drink. And there is an image from the Met, and that is obviously not Sakas, it's a lady, but she's holding the cup with three fingers. So that this is the civilized form that seems to pervade, certainly in the Iranian court. Okay. And of course, there's no more famous cupbearer in antiquity than Nehemiah of our biblical tradition, who was the cupbearer to King Artaxerxes I, the great Achaemenid Persian king. Uh, for him, and the office of cupbearer, now we can reconstruct again as a tagar, uh, in Nehemiah, it states, and it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, when wine was before him, that I took up the wine and gave it onto the king. So, uh, Acting as a cupbearer, you become actually a close confidant of the king because, of course, you have to make sure that you're not poisoned. And the cupbearer here plays a very important role. And so the relation between the king and the cupbearer was quite of importance in antiquity. And luckily, we have, through biblical tradition, uh, a mention of the cupbearer of the great Persian king. And that's a manuscript, I think, from Spain, 13th century, from Portugal, excuse me, from the National Library of Portugal, where it shows uh, the image of Nehemiah and King Artaxerxes. I'm going to just move around. Um, in this Persian Empire, the province of Fars in southwestern Iran is the really the heart, the epicenter where these Persians rise to power. And in these Persepolis fortification tablets, we find in Elamite the name of a city that seems to have been interesting, at least certainly it's interesting today for us, and it's either with T or Sh, Shirazish, which uh, is nowhere else but the city of Shiraz, uh, sort of a wonderful, beautiful city in southwestern Iran, which is the house of poets uh, and mystics. And uh, we find that it is in Shiraz that another tale spins about great wine. Again, the place where the Persian Empire uh, is located. And that is our medieval crusader, uh, Gaspar de Strimberg, who, uh, it's a very nice tale, and I think uh, Christian is going to tell us if there are really any questions or not. Uh, he gets on his horse and goes all the way to Shiraz, takes the grape wine, and comes back and goes on the hill of Hermitage. Very nice place to have wine, by the way. A fantastic wine. Uh, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Let's imagine. And um, hence, they produce Syrah. And of course, Syrah comes from the term Shiraz. So I want you to, again, think about the empire and its lore, and then the stories and how things revolve around it and makes it even more fantastic, I think, than it is. So if I can have that question, please, I would be very happy at some time. Now, moving on to uh, the post achaemenid Persian Empire, when the Arsakids, who ruled for about five centuries, come to power, uh, leave us very less much, you might say, sources to deal with, but they leave us lots of silverware and actually metalware which I think the largest collection is held at the Getty Villa, if I'm not mistaken, as we were told by Sarah Cole's uh, presentation at UCLA a couple of weeks ago. 
So please go look at this silverware. And this is what you drink wine out of uh, right on. And of course, uh, depending on what kind of metal is it, or if it's earthware, uh, your status and you know who you were was clearly um, uh, was shown. And of course, if you were a cultured um, person, I would think that uh, remember the three uh, the fiala that you hold with three fingers, uh, you would actually take that right on and pour the wine into the fiala. Okay. And of course, before this, the bowl had poured the wine, and then you could drink it. Now, that's not always so, but certainly for uh, the Parthians, that may have also been the case. And of course, if you have a lion, and maybe drinking from a lion's right on, that is giving you all the characteristics and prowess of a lion. And you find fantastic animals sometimes uh, at the head of these right ons. And here's a nice Roman fresco. You see that gentleman, how is he drinking? There is no cups. He's going straight. He's just letting this thing pour. And I'm sure he may be getting drunk a little bit faster. Now, uh, we hear that in Central Asian uh, nomadic tribes also had similar taste in drinking wine rather than pouring it onto a fiale and sort of drinking it little by little. So it's all about taste but also to mind your manners in some ways, I think. And uh, in Parthian, the language of the Parthian Empire, we find terminology for the cupbearer or the wine bringer, meibar, and um, actually vineyards, maestan and raspan. And in fact, I'm repeating the same, the same terminology, but this is something more, I think, closer akin to a Parthian nobleman from the provinces. This is from uh, a banquet, a funeral banquet from Palmyra, uh, Tadmor, where the gentleman, the nobility, is obviously doing what? Holding the cup. Look, it's almost three fingers, I think, no? I think it's holding a three finger. Uh, and so that's how your culturally, uh, cultural courts should uh, take care of wine. Um, the Arsa kids uh, in what is modern-day Turkmenistan built their necropolis. And when it was excavated, uh, thousands of ostracas, potsherds, were found right here. This was the archive of the Arsakid Empire. And it told us so much about the economy, about the religious world, about calendar, uh, what they believed in. It was really fantastic. And of course, that's a huge right on. Look at that. That's from Nisa. And these ostracas are also from Nisa. And so, uh, mm, for example, that ostraca tells us in this phytos, in this jar, there is 20 mari of wine brought by wine factor Bagindat, who is from the village of uh, Vard Matak, from the Uzabai vineyard, which is in the state of Artaban Khan, called Artak Shahra Khan, delivered for the year 206, so uh, just uh, about uh, two decades before the first common century. And we have lots of these documents. We know there are lots of vineyards, and wine is being used, in fact, for taxation and for trade. Moving on to the last of these ancient Iranian empires, uh, that is the Sasanian Empire, China just a little bit more, but I will spend much less time on that. Uh, we find that in the Sasanian Empire from 224 to 651 CE, uh, now we have actually much more information about taste and what kind of wine exists. And these come from a variety of sources. That's a nice bowl in the back of it. You could see the vineyards where we find in Middle Persian, that people liked white wine and red wine, as we do today. And of course, the wine had to be sometimes clarified, so we had unclarified wine as well. And really crystal-colored wine. Now that I've drinking wine, I would translate that crystal-color wine, the last one, Badage Avgin. And so there's a host of now different wines, and uh, probably where they come from are different regions. In fact, uh, a Middle Persian text from the Sasanian period uh, provides us in a dialogue between a young man, a page, who says, by the way, I'm like a very good Som Somalier, to the king. 
And so the king begins asking him about everything. What's the best meats? Uh, what's the best, you know, uh, sweets, a dessert, and also wine? And this youth uh, goes to answer, the wine of Herat. That is modern-day Afghanistan, Western Afghanistan. And Marvrud, which is Transoxiana. Uh, and the wine of Boost, again, in Afghanistan. And the wine of Holwan. But with the Assyrian wine, remember our map where Assyria and northern Mesopotamia was shown? That seems to have been really a good place from the Achaemenid period all the way to the Sasanian period. Uh, Assyrian wine and the Basarganian wine, no wine can compete. So these people were very much attuned and they wanted to see where to get the best wine to drink. Obviously, uh, an empire and a king can do this, but we know uh, on the lesser scale, in the provinces as well, the same mannerism and request for the best and what is beautiful for the palate was indeed uh, gotten. So what happens when the Arab Muslims in the 7th century conquer the Iranian plateau? In Islam, uh, legally, the consumption of wine or intoxicants in some way, it's unclear, is forbidden. So if we didn't have these letters that were just found actually a decade ago, we would say the Muslims came and they said, okay, no more wine drinking, and everybody says, fine, no more wine drinking, and no more pig meat, as there was lots of uh, boars that were hunted. But these letters that were found in the, uh, from the region of Qum, this is the central city in Iran, which now is a religious center for Shiism, and then from Sabot Ku in northeastern Iran, close to the Caspian, two sets of archives have been found uh, in Middle Persian, and they date from about 70s or 60s after the death of the last Sasanian king. So this is date 73, so 651. It's early, uh, actually, 8th century. All the way through the 9th century, you see people are actually uh, trading in wine, they're producing wine on their uh, vineyards. There doesn't seem to be a problem. And so uh, this letter says, this month of Amordad, if you are in tune with so the Persian language, they're not using uh, Islamic calendar. They're using it's still the old Zoroastrian calendar. In the year of 73 of the last Sasanian king after his death, Aduroi described by the order of the one who is in charge of investigating the tillage in order to find out about the property, evaluated the land called Vineyard, which belongs to the Bun, uh, share of the village of Hasbin Ras. So here we, here we understand about rent, which is being paid by wine. And the amount of wine is clearly based on a measuring system that's uh, Cadiz, it's pre-Islamic, and it is based on cauldrons, dig. So you would know the Persian term if you spoke Persian. So Lots of digs of wine are being traded on the Iranian plateau in what we call, quote-unquote, Islamic period. And uh, this doesn't really stop as such in this way. Um, I will give you one last slide to show you that, but I want to answer Herodotus. Remember, Herodotus says these Persians, uh, when they want to make a decision, they drink, they get drunk, and then the next morning they wake up and they make sure they've made the right decision. I think to understand what Herodotus had heard is to actually read through Middle Persian Zoroastrian texts about what happens when you drink wine. And I think the answer to Herodotus is this text that is about a thousand years apart, but I think uh, very well answers it. This text called the Minuya Kherat, perhaps sixth century of common era, states, this that is forgetting will be remembered. That is if you drink wine. And goodness will take place in thought. But anyone who drinks wine must be conscious to drink in moderation, since through moderate drinking of wine, this much goodness will come to him and increase intelligence and the mind. Okay? So if you drink moderately, <laughs> yeah, see? Uh, this, they, they had already understood this. Now, uh, <laughs> Clearly had understood this. Uh, the problem is Herodotus were hearing tales, right? So these persons are getting drunk, ah, and then the next morning they come and say, no, 
uh, what happens is that pr they probably had wine, they made decisions, but just to make sure that they've made the right decisions, they would again reconsider what they were doing. Okay? I think that is the answer to Herodotus' observation. As I said, uh, in the post-Sasanian, what we call Islamic period, uh, things don't stop. Although there are prohibitions, obviously in the city of Shiraz, sort of the city of poets, uh, if you know about Hafez, there's no way that you would miss sort of the love of wine. And I would just take it, no mysticism right there. It's just really the wine that is good, uh, as well as other poets. And here is uh, one of these uh, steadfast Shiite uh, rulers uh, of the Buyid period, Azuzo Dole, in the 10th century. And he uh, commissioned uh, medallions. And what does he put on his medallions? Yes, he's holding the cup. And I promise you, this is not water. <laughs> well, it can't be. And uh, you might have a sommelier or the cup bearer right there. And so uh, this tradition continues, and we find this in the textual sources as well. So I just put masti or rasti, which is a nice Persian proverb, uh, drunkenness and telling the truth. When you're drunk, you tell the truth. Thank you so much. <laughs>